Hello, my name is Jordan Bird, and I'm here to present this work, Overcoming Data Scarcity in Speaker Identification, Dataset Augmentation with Synthetic MFCCs via Character Level RNN. This is a work by myself, Jordan J. Bird, Diego Alfaria, Cristiano Premabida, Anico Eckhart, and Pedro PSA Rosa. The work is from the Aston Lab for Robotics, Vision and Intelligent Systems, the Arvis Lab and we are in collaboration with the University of Coimbra in Portugal, which is where Cristiano Primavida is from, and Londrina State University in Londrina, Brazil, which is where Pedro Paulo da Silva Airosa is from. So just before we get started, this presentation was originally presented at ICARSC 2020. Um, I'm re-recording it now for my YouTube channel. It was a few months ago that it was actually presented and published. So a lot has happened since then. So this is the overcoming today's scarcity where we use uh, character level RNNs. But we have uh, we have performed an extension to the work, a vast extension, where we benchmark LSTMs and OpenAI's GPT-2 for generating synthetic speech and, uh, and, and overcoming data scarcity and speaker recognition. There's a link there on the screen um, that you can find it on my website and I'll also put a link in the description to the uh, to the to the preprint for the journal. And you can take a look there. So to summarize what we did, we gathered speech data from a range of subjects. We gathered a large corpus of speech data online in the form of the Flickr 8K data set. And this provided us provided us the task of speaker recognition, which is to re identify that singular speaker from all of the rest. So is person A speaking or the rest of the group? What we do in this experiment is we generate synthetic speech to transfer learn from, which we find ultimately improves the classification for all individual subjects. So where, what, what are the impacts of this work? Well, we improve speaker classification without having to gather a lot of data from the subject. And we also find that character level recurrent neural networks, the char RNNs, um, are able to generate new MFCC data, which is useful, contains, contains useful knowledge. And that was, in, that was in the form of human speech. So let's just quickly go over the proposed approach. We can see here three neural networks. Network one is trained on identifying the real speakers versus Flickr 8K. Network two is trained on the speakers and the synthetic data versus Flickr 8K. Network three is trained on the speakers versus Flickr 8K with the weights transferred from network two. And so please bear in mind that network two is there just to learn some weights and transfer to network three. We actually only compare networks one and three since they're training and classifying identical data. And so they're directly comparable at which one performs the task better than the other, if any. So again, just to quickly go over that again, we only compare networks one and three, and thus the accuracy metrics are directly comparable since all data is the same, and we only transfer weights from the synthetic speech data. The synthetic speech data, the classification and or accuracy thereof is not included in, in the comparison of metrics. It, is, it exists only to derive some weights for network three. So we also we started with data collection we collected data from three subjects all spoke a selection of the harvard sentences from the ieee recommended practice for speech quality measurements in table one there's an exam there there, there there shows the three subjects we've got two males one female age 23 24 and 28 respectively one was british one was american one was irish the british person was from birmingham that was myself the american male was from tampa florida and the Irish female was from Dublin. As you can see, it took myself longer to speak the sentences, 24 seconds as opposed to 13 and 12 seconds. And so there were more data objects captured for myself. But this just goes to show that when, when, when you're dealing with international accents and dialects, you are going to find that some people will provide more data than others, even if they're saying exactly the same sentences. And so to classify these three subjects against a large data set is a difficult task because we have we have data scarcity. 
especially like let's 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 take a look at the Irish female for example we have 2542 data objects of this person speaking and we want to classify them against the Flickr 8k subset of 100,000 data objects it's a very difficult task So if we think of this in terms of calibration of a smart home device, if one were to calib calibrate Amazon Alexa, it takes it takes a lot longer than 12 seconds to calibrate Amazon Alexa. And that's performing some biometrics and, and speaker classification within there and uh, among some other tasks. So why do we use scarce data? Why do we want to go down this route of having scarce data and cause cause trouble for ourselves? Well, for one, it's convenient for the user because as users of new technology, we don't want to have to provide a lot of data to a system. It takes time, it takes effort, and it gives us the idea that the system may be low quality or maybe we get suspicious. What's it doing with all this data it's collecting from us? And of course, very recently, and since these devices started to become popular, people tend to be against the idea that their devices are listening to them all the time. And I, I know I'm someone who agrees with this with my Amazon Alexa device. I do get concerned that it might be listening to me when I, when, I, when I don't want it to. So how do we generate the data sets? Well, we, uh, we transfer, transform the audio into its MEL frequency sexual coefficients, MFCCs, which gives a temporal numeric data set. For each subject, we then train a character level recurrent neural network, the char RNN, to generate new synthetic MFCCs, and this is in the form of or in the form of text, and the CSV goes in, data comes out. And we, we benchmark this because character level RNNs, they tend to be used for natural language processing, generation of, of new text, especially with the, the little Shakespeare example. But it's not previously been used for this problem. It's not previously been used for generating MFCCs or human speech. So this is this is an entirely new exploration. So we generate the synthetic data sets. 10,000 synthetic rows of data are generated for each subject, split into four chunks of 2,500. So we can test 2,500, 5,000, 7,500, and the full 10,000 and how it affects. In the bottom right in that table is the topology of the character level recurrent neural network. As we can see from this example, the synthetic data isn't perfect. On the left there we have subject one speaking a line and on the right there we have the MFCCs trying to generate synthetic data from subject one. And so there are similar behaviours which is promising. So on the, if, if we train a network on the right is there useful knowledge in there so, uh, so we can use that to classify the subject on the left, the real subject? Well as we found that is the case. And although the quality, although the data isn't perfect and it's by no means actual human speech, it's just sort of similar to it. Well, it, it does it does contain at least some statistically useful information. So to train the classification networks, those networks one to three I previously described, we train networks to classify the speaker from the speaker and the Flickr 8K data set. It's a binary classification problem. Is the speaker speaking or is it someone else? In a previous work, we performed a genetic search of the best MLP topology for MFCC classification, and we found that three hidden layers of 30, 7, and 29 neurons, respectively, were the, was the best result in that experiment. So we used this topology for this classification network. For each subject, we then train a set of four classification networks exposed to synthetic data, as I said, in those blocks of 2,500, 2,500, 5,000, 7,500 and 10,000 synthetic data objects. Then the weights from the exposed networks, and by exposed networks I mean those networks that have trained with the synthetic data, are transferred to a classification task of the Flickr data plus recorded audio. That is, they are now directly comparable to the first networks since the data to classify is identical. The initial weight distribution is transferred from the networks exposed to synthetic data. All networks are validated through tenfold cross-validation.
For all subjects, a network exposed to synthetic data improved classification metrics. As we can see here, subject one, the accuracy of zero synthetic data objects, which is just the real data versus the flicker 8K is 93.57%, with F F1 precision and recall of 0.9493 .9 and 93 respectively. But that was outperformed when the network was exposed to 7,500 synthetic data objects, in which case, the accuracy rose to 99.03%, a significant increase, with F1 precision and recall scores of 0.99. Similarly, with subject two, with no synthetic data exposure, 95.13%, 0.95 F1 precision and recall. But then when it was exposed to 5,000 synthetic data objects, the accuracy rises to 99.19% with the same as subject one, 0.99 F1 precision and recall. And then subject three, Zero data objects, 96.58% vanilla classification accuracy, but when 10,000 synthetic data objects were introduced, that takes us to 98.83% classification accuracy. Again, with the other two subjects, this also takes the F1 precision and recall to 0.99. So the best amount of synthetic data exposure for subjects, subject one, 7,500, subject two, 5,000, subject three, 10,000. In future work, we'll aim to figure out if there is generally a best rule of thumb for number of synthetic data, because there's quite a mix here. All three results were different. Is there a certain number of synthetic data that will improve the problem or, or not? Well, we'll that's, a, that's a question to explore in the future. So now that we know training from synthetic data can improve synthetic data speaker classification, we could benchmark other generative models such as the GAN, DC GAN, PG GAN, introduce more subjects, optimize the generative model to speed up the process. In the preprint that's available, or it might even be published now, we, we performed an extension where we, we introduced, I believe, five subjects and we benchmarked an LSTM versus OpenAI's GPT-2, and we found that LSTM and GPT-2 were both superior to the to the method of just normal class of binary classification of real versus other speaker data. So it's definitely a very promising promising approach. I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, as I said, I've re-recorded this presentation for my YouTube channel which I've, I've just started getting into recently. If you did enjoy watching the video, please drop a like and I will be uploading any presentation I perform. I'm going to re-record for my YouTube channel. So if you enjoy my work and want to follow the, the rest of my research, please uh, subscribe and um, you'll, you'll, get those, you'll get those videos through. My website is jordanjamesbird.com. All my work's available on there and some projects I'm working on. Uh, all my publications on there and things that I'm working on that I'm not going to publish. There's some AI art on there. And uh, the lab I work at, at Aston University is the Arvis Lab, and the URL is arvis-lab.io. So feel free to drop us a visit and um, take a look at what we're working on. Lots of interesting projects going on right there at the moment. Thank you again for listening. Thank you very much.